Before today's video, we want to bring you a word from AppZone, who is a regular sponsor of this channel. AppZone is an app that suggests games to play, and then you earn money for just trying the games. Then the longer you play, the more you'll earn. AppZone pays out instantly through retailers like Google Play, Xbox, Visa, Steam, Amazon, and more. Every week I seem to find a new game which is a lot of fun to play, and I'm getting paid out in Amazon gift cards. If you download AppZone by clicking on the link below the video, you'll be directly supporting Krimly Listed. So help us keep the lights on and start earning money for yourself for playing games by downloading AppZone today. Without any further delay, here's today's video. Number 2. Dana Chisholm Dana Chisholm was born in August 1969 in Rock Hill, South Carolina. She was a decent student, and in high school, she was a cheerleader. Like a lot of teenagers, Dana experimented with drugs, and at one point, she ran away from home. She eventually strained out her life, and she went to college to study business. After college, in 1993, Dana moved to Washington, D.C., and just over a year later, she got a job as a secretary at a think tank. Dana's real dream was to be a singer. Her friends and family said that she sang like Whitney Houston. Just after 1 a.m. on February 27, 1995, Dana's parents, who lived in Rock Hill, received a strange phone call. The caller said that he was Lieutenant Lewis Douglas from the Metropolitan Police Department, and he said that Dana had been arrested for prostitution. The caller said that Dana was really upset, and she didn't want him to call her parents. The caller gave her parents a phone number where he could be reached, and then he ended the call. Dana's father thought that the caller didn't speak like a police officer. He sounded edgy. He spoke fast and very loudly. Dana's parents tried to get a hold of her later that day, but they were unable to. They decided to call back Lieutenant Lewis Douglas. When he answered the phone, Dana's father was shocked because Douglas had a different voice than the man who originally called them. Dana's father asked about his daughter, and Lieutenant Douglas said that he didn't call them. Of course, this only made Dana's father more confused, and Douglas didn't understand what was going on either. Douglas wasn't sure how the caller knew his office phone number. What was odd was that Douglas knew who Dana Chisholm was because he had been at her apartment weeks earlier. He was there because someone had stolen her television. So Dana's father asked Douglas to go check on her. Douglas drove over to Dana's basement apartment, which was in one of the safest neighborhoods in D.C. Her neighbor was the former director of the FBI. Douglas knocked on her door and he heard no movement inside. He left his business card at her front door. Dana's parents continued to try and get in contact with her, but they couldn't. At around 6 p.m., a friend of Dana's called her landlord because she didn't come into work that day. Her landlord ended up calling the police. Dana's body was found in her apartment. She had been strangled to death with a cord. The medical examiner estimated that the time of death was about 9 p.m. the day before she was found. Her apartment showed no signs of a break-in or forced entry. Not far from the apartment, a reporter found a key to the apartment. The police aren't sure if it was a key that Dana had given someone or if it was a spare key that Dana had hidden somewhere outside of her apartment. The apartment had been ransacked. It's believed that while the killer was ransacking the apartment, he found Lieutenant Douglas's business card. Then about four hours after he killed Dana, he called her parents posing as Douglas. On the back door of the apartment, the police found a note that read, I'll be back, and then there were the initials, MPD. The lead detective on the case, Michael Farish, thought that the initials meant Metropolitan Police Department. The note was not left there by Lieutenant Douglas when he came to check on Dana. 
This note was found at the back door, and Douglas left his business card at the front door. Farish began to investigate Dana's private life. Since moving to D.C., she had dated several men, and she was working as an escort. She would go on dates with the men, and then tell them that she needed money to pay her bills and her rent. It also turned out that Dana was four weeks pregnant. She had told a friend at work about the pregnancy, and when her parents had talked to her last, which was about a week before she was killed, Dana said that she planned on coming home to tell them some big news. Not long after the murder, a man with a raspy voice called the Homicide Division looking for Farish. He said that he wanted to talk about Dana Chisholm's murder. The first few times he called, Farish wasn't at his desk. The man left messages for Farish, telling him that he should phone him back, but the caller would never leave a callback number. A few weeks after the murder, Farish was at his desk when the man called. The caller said that he knew why Dana was killed. He said it was because of her lifestyle. He said that she went out to clubs, she drank, and she had sex with many men. The caller was adamant that Farish should share those details with the reporters who were covering the story. Farish ended up doing the opposite. He told the reporters that Dana was a naive young woman. Farish was hoping that by going against the caller's demands, they would force him to call again and possibly expose his identity. Not long after Farish's comments were published, Farish got another call from the man with the raspy voice. He was angry that Farish didn't tell the reporters the truth. For the next two months, the man with the raspy voice called him twice more. Both conversations were short and testy. On the last call, the man told Farish that they should meet. He told Farish to meet him at a place just east of the river. Farish went to the area and waited for several hours, but the man with the raspy voice never showed up. Farish hopes that one day the man with the raspy voice will call him again. Or even better, he'll turn himself in. At the time of this video, the murder of Dana Chisholm is considered cold. Number 1. Susan Eads At the end of August 1983, 19-year-old Susan Eads was working two waitressing jobs at bars near NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. When she could get the gig, she worked as a DJ. On August 30th, 1983, Susan was working at a bar called Jason's Club in Webster, Texas. At the end of her shift, she left the bar alone. The next morning, her body was found hidden behind a bush in an empty lot that was a couple miles from the bar. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death with the jumpsuit that she was wearing. Her car was found close by in the parking lot of a business that sold boats. Her purse, her high school class ring, and her gold necklace were missing. The police interviewed people who were at the bar the last time that Eads was seen alive. They said that a man asked her to dance, and she turned him down. No one at the bar knew who the man was, but they gave a description that resulted in this sketch. One big problem is that the police have no idea if the man was involved in the murder because Susan left the bar alone that night. Shortly after the murder, Susan's mother, Shirley, who lived in Seabrook, Texas, started to receive strange phone calls. At first, the caller would just hang up after she answered. Then the caller started talking to Shirley. He identified himself as Bill, and he said he lived on Telephone Road in Houston, which is an actual road in Houston. Shirley got in touch with the police, and they recorded some of the phone calls. These clips, which were made public in 2018, are from the actual phone calls. Hello? Hello? You said you knew Sue. Well, I still can't believe that I 
never knew what he, I don't understand me. Some people have a secret, you know, they like to keep themselves. You have some pictures of her, you told me. I'd like to see. Just you, I can not show them to anyone else. Would you want me to meet you somewhere? My place or a motel or something like that. Where'd you say you used to get some? Here's some phone calls. Unfortunately, the caller never stayed on the line long enough for the police to trace where the calls were coming from. The police are hoping that someone will recognize the voice. If the voice is identified, it could also help solve several other murders. Susan's body was found about 10 miles away from one of the most infamous dumping grounds for bodies, the Texas Killing Fields. The field is named the Calder Oil Field and it's 25 acres of land inside the city limits of League City, Texas, which is south of Houston and north of Galveston. The field is close to Interstate 45, which is marked with a red line on this map. Since 1971, dozens of women and girls who live near the field in Interstate 45 have been murdered or have gone missing. The police think that at least four serial killers were active in the area between 1971 to the early 2000s. It's possible that Susan was a victim of one of these serial killers, or her murder may have just been a one-off. The first known victim associated with the Texas killing fields is 13-year-old Colette Wilson. On June 17, 1971, her band instructor dropped her off on a street corner in Manville, Texas. When her mother pulled up to the corner six minutes later to pick her up, she was gone. Fifteen days later, 14-year-old Brenda Jones disappeared from Gavelston. Her body was found floating in the water the next day near Pelican Island, which is part of the city of Gavelston. The cause of death was manual strangulation. A month later, on August 4, 1971, two 14-year-old girls, Rhonda Johnson and Sharon Shaw, vanished after spending the afternoon at a beach in Gavelston. Two months later, on August 28, 19-year-old Gloria Gonzalez disappeared from Houston. On November 3rd, about a week after Gloria Gonzalez disappeared, 16-year-old Adele Crabtree left the hippie commune where she was living in Houston to hitchhike to work. Hours later, another young woman went missing. 21-year-old Linda Faye Sutherland was last seen leaving a bar on Telephone Road at 12.30 a.m. on November 4th. Telephone Road is the same road that Bill, the mysterious caller, told Susan Eads' mother he lived on. Hours after Sutherland was last seen alive, the body of Adele Crabtree was found near Conroe, Texas. She was fully clothed, and she had been shot twice with a shotgun. On November 7th, the body of Linda Faye Sutherland was found in a ditch a few miles from where she was last seen. She had been strangled, but that wasn't the cause of death. She had been shot with a shotgun, and she had 72 bullet wounds in her back, shoulders, and legs. Two weeks after that, the mother of 12-year-old Allison Craven who lived in Houston, reported her missing. Her mother had left her home alone while she ran out to do some errands. When she came home, Allison wasn't there, and the contents of Allison's purse were strewn about the home. Six days later, on November 15, 1971, two 15 year old girls, Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson, went missing while hitchhiking in Gavelston. Two days later, their partially nude bodies were found floating in Turner's Bayou, about 10 miles away from where they were last seen. Both had been shot in the head twice. On November 26, 1971, less than a week after Debbie and Maria's bodies were found, the body of 19-year-old Gloria Gonzalez was found. Gonzalez vanished six days before Debbie and Maria went missing. Her body was found near the Attic's Reservoir, which is in West Houston. During the autopsy, the medical examiner discovered that a tooth that was recovered from the dump site didn't belong to Gonzalez. He thought the tooth must have come from another body that was dumped nearby, so he suggested a larger search of the area. 
Three days after Gonzalez's body was found, the remains of the first victim, Paulette Wilson, were found not far from Gonzalez's remains. Her head was missing. It was found four days later, not far from the rest of her remains. It had probably been moved by animals. The medical examiner concluded that Colette probably died from blunt force trauma to the head, while Gonzalez had probably been strangled to death. By the time 1971 came to an end, ten young women had disappeared between Houston and Gavelston. Only seven other bodies have been found. Just three days into 1972, the bodies of Rhonda Johnson and Sharon Shaw, who went missing five months earlier, were found. Sharon's skull was found in Clear Lake, which is just north of League City and south of Houston. The rest of her remains, and the remains of Rhonda, were found in a nearby marshland. They had been bound and shot to death. Around the same time that their remains were found, some of 12-year-old Allison Craven's remains were found in a field not far from her home. A month later, the rest of her remains were found dumped in a field of Pearland, about 10 miles away from where she went missing. The string of murders of teenage girls shocked the people of Greater Houston and Galveston County, and understandably, people were afraid. Their panic started to subside in the spring of 1972 when several arrests were made. It started in April when 25-year-old Henry Lanham was charged with murdering Linda Sutherland, the seventh young woman, to go missing. Lanham had a criminal record that included a conviction for sexual assault. On the night that Sutherland went missing, Lanham was seen talking to her at the bar. The police originally tried to interview Lanham months earlier about the murder, but he refused to cooperate. So the police kept him under constant surveillance, and the stress apparently got to be too much for him. In April 1972, after months of constant surveillance, he supposedly confessed, but he said that he wasn't the person who physically shot Sutherland. He said he was just present at the murder. He said that 22-year-old Anthony Michael Nopa was the person who shot Sutherland. Nopa was arrested, and in June 1972, he supposedly confessed to shooting Sutherland. Around the same time that Nopa confessed, Lanham also apparently confessed to the murders of Colette Wilson, Gloria Gonzalez, and Adele Crabtree. Both men went to trial in October 1972 for the murder of Linda Faye Sutherland. They both testified that they were coerced into making the confessions, and they swore that they were innocent. Nopa said that an officer threatened to shoot him if he didn't confess, and then the officer said he was going to cover up the shooting by making it look like Nopa was trying to escape. Both Lanham and Nopa were found guilty. Nopa was given a sentence of 50 years in prison, and Lanham was sentenced to 25 years in prison. As 1972 was coming to an end, Lanham was being held in the Harris County Jail awaiting his trial for the murders of Colette Wilson and Gloria Gonzalez. But he would never face those charges. On December 30th, 1972, Lanham was shot to death during an apparent escape attempt. In May 1972, a month after Nopa and Lanham were arrested, there was an arrest in the murder of 12-year-old Allison Craven. 22-year-old Henry Doyle Shufflin, a Vietnam vet with a history of mental illness, apparently confessed to the murder. In October 1973, he pleaded guilty to first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Two years later, Shufflin filed an appeal. He said he was innocent, and that the confession and the guilty plea were both coerced. He said he only agreed to plead guilty because the judge on the case implied that he would get early parole if he pleaded guilty. Shufflin said that the judge even showed him a letter that he had written recommending that Shufflin should get early parole if he pleaded guilty. Shufflin's appeal was ultimately denied. Finally, in June 1972, about a month after Shufflin was arrested, 
the police in Webster, Texas, made an arrest. 24-year-old Michael Lloyd Self was charged with the murder of 14-year-old Sharon Shaw, but not with the murder of 14-year-old Rhonda Johnson, who was murdered at the same time as Sharon. They were the third and fourth girls to go missing. It was done this way because if the district attorney failed to convict Self of Sharon's murder, then they could have had him charged with Rhonda's murder. Self, who worked as a gas station attendant, has first run in with the law in 1970 when he was arrested for a peeping Tom incident. He wasn't given jail time over the incident. Instead, he was ordered to receive psychiatric treatment. Self then found himself on the radar of Michael Morris, who had recently become chief of police in Webster. Morris first encountered Self when he was investigating the theft of some gas from the fire chief's station wagon. In June 1972, Morris brought Self into the police station to interview him about the murders of Sharon Shaw and Rhonda Johnson. After a few hours, Self supposedly confessed to the murders and he signed the confession. However, just like Lanham Nopa and Shufflin, Self swore that the confession was coerced and that he was innocent. He claimed that Morris threatened to beat him with a nightstick. When that threat didn't work, Self said that Morris took out his revolver, removed all the bullets but one, and then spun the cylinder. Self said that Morris held the gun to his head and told him to confess. When he didn't, Morris pulled the trigger. Luckily, there was no bullet in that chamber, but the game of Russian roulette convinced Self to confess. At Self's trial, his lawyer pointed out that his confession was full of inaccuracies. For example, he said he dumped the bodies 20 miles away from where they were found. He also said that he beat the girls on the head with a coke bottle, but the medical examiner determined that they didn't suffer any head injuries. Finally, Self confessed that he took their clothes with him, but their clothes were found with their remains. Self was found guilty, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Two years after Self was convicted, there was another arrest. The person who was arrested was Michael Morris, the former chief of police in Webster, who was responsible for putting Self in prison. Morris and the former assistant police chief in Webster were arrested by a posse of citizens in Cato Mills, Texas, after they robbed a bank. It turned out that Morris, along with the former assistant police chief and a third man, had been involved in a string of bank robberies around Texas that started in 1972. Morris was convicted of the bank robberies and he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. The problem was that even with the three men in prison and one dead, the killings didn't stop. On October 20th, 1972, which was the same day that Lanham and Nopa were convicted, 15-year-old Mildred Joanne Knighton vanished from Pasadena, Texas. Her body was found in an industrial area of Pasadena three days later. She had been stabbed 61 times in the back, 9 times in the face, and her throat had been slashed nearly to the point of decapitation. On January 3, 1973, 16-year-old Kimberly Pitchford attended a driver's ed class at a high school in Houston. The class ended at 6 p.m. and she was supposed to call home for a ride. She never called and she never came home. Her body was found two days later under a bridge in a canal about 25 miles away from where she was last seen. The cause of death was ligature strangulation. On September 6, 1974, about 20 months after Kimberly Pitchford was killed, 14-year-old Georgia Greer and 12-year-old Brooks Bracewell vanished as they walked to school in Dickinson, Texas. The police told the girls' parents that the girls had probably just run away and they would most likely return at any time. Thirteen months later, the girls still had not returned home and another teenage girl disappeared. On October 22, 1975, 16-year-old Nina Lynn Klug watched Game 7 of the World Series at a friend's home in Rocheron, Texas, 
and then she left on her own to drive to her home in Cypress, Texas. Sadly, she never made it there. Her car, which had a dead battery, was found on the shoulder of Highway 6 near Arcola. Her nude body was found in a ditch lying on a pile of clothes close to Rocheron on Thanksgiving Day, which was about a month after she went missing. A year and a half after 14-year-old Georgia Greer and 12-year-old Brooks Bracewell vanished, their skulls were found near Alvin, Texas, not too far from where Collette Wilson, the first victim, was last seen alive. Both of their skulls showed signs of blunt force trauma. The rest of their remains were not with their skulls. Nearly a year after the skulls of the two girls were found, on May 21, 1977, 12 year old Suzanne Bowers walked out of her grandparents' home in Gavelston. She planned to walk the mile to her home, get her bike, and then meet her friends at the beach. She never made it to the beach, and when she didn't return home that evening, her parents reported her missing. Her body was found nearly two years to the day that she went missing in Santa Fe, Texas, which is about 20 miles away from where she was last seen. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. A month before Suzanne's body was found, 12-year-old Angela Desiree Kelly, who lived in Pasadena, was found murdered not far from her home. Her hands had been tied behind her back, and she had been strangled to death. The summer of 1979 nearly ended without another murder, but then a 12-year-old went missing from Conroe, Texas. On September 7, 1979, Alicia Michelle Jackson was swimming with her brothers at a public pool, and then she left the pool to walk home without them. Her body was found six days later in an oil field, about 17 miles away from where she was last seen. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. As the 1970s ended, the murder seemed to come to an end as well. Then on July 1st, 1982, 22-year-old Tamara Ellen McCurry disappeared from Gavelston. She was last seen getting into a strange van. Her body has never been found. Fourteen months later, Susan Eads was murdered. She was the 20th young woman or girl to go missing or to be murdered in the area since 1971. Another 14 months went by without another murder or disappearance. Then on December 10th, 1983, 23-year-old Heidi Villarreal Fife disappeared after visiting a convenience store in League City. 16 days later, 14-year-old Sandra Ramber's mother made an odd discovery when she arrived home. The front door of their house in Santa Fe was open and biscuits were baking in the oven but there was no sign of Sandra. Sadly, Sandra's body has never been found. In April 1984, the remains of Heidi Villarreal Fife were found in the oil field on Calder Road, which is known as the Texas Killing Fields. Months later, on July 29, 1984, 29-year-old Ellen Ray Beeson went missing after spending the evening at a nightclub in Lake City. In September 1984, a couple of months after Alan Ray Beeson went missing, 16-year-old Laura Miller disappeared. She was last seen at the same convenience store in Lake City where Heidi Villarreal Fife was last seen 11 months earlier. Then in July 1985, there was a strange twist in the disappearance of 29-year-old Alan Ray Beeson who went missing a year earlier after visiting a nightclub in Lake City. A woman named Candy Gifford, who was a friend of Beeson's and was with her at the bar on the last night that she was seen alive, went to the police with an unusual story. Gifford said that when she left the bar, she noticed that Beeson was talking to Clyde Edward Hedrick. Over the next several months, any time that Gifford saw Hendrick, she asked him what happened to Beeson. Hedrick kept brushing off Gifford, then he finally decided to show her what happened to her friend. He took her to the Galveston Causeway and under an abandoned couch was Beeson's body. Hedrick said that after the bar that night, 
Ian Beeson went skinny dipping, and she drowned. He didn't think that anyone would believe that her death was an accident, so he hid her body under the couch. Frederick told Gifford not to tell anyone about the body, or he would kill her and her family. Gifford didn't say anything to anyone for a few months, but then in July 1985, she told the police. Frederick was arrested, and he told the police that Beeson had drowned. They couldn't find any evidence to the contrary, so he was charged and then convicted of abuse of a corpse. He served a year in prison for the conviction. On October 5, 1985, 17-year-old Michelle Doherty Thomas left her home in Santa Fe with two male friends. She didn't return home that evening, and two days later, her family filed a missing persons report. The police interviewed Michelle's friends that she was last seen with. The friends said that they were going out to a bar, but they stopped at a convenience store first. At the convenience store, Michelle supposedly got into a different man's car, and that was the last time they saw her. They later changed their story, and said that when they were stopped at an intersection, a man forced Michelle to get out of their car and into his, and that was the last time they saw her. The police tracked down the man who supposedly kidnapped Michelle, and he was charged with her murder. However, those charges were eventually dropped. Michelle's body has never been found, and it's unknown if her disappearance is connected to the rash of murders, or if her disappearance is just a one-off. On February 2, 1986, the remains of a woman were found in the oil field on Calder Road. The remains have never been identified, and she is simply called Jane Doe. It's believed that she was about 25 years old. She was 5 foot 5 and weighed about 140 pounds. She had shoulder length reddish brown hair. She had been shot in the back and she had been in the field anywhere from 6 weeks to 6 months before she was found. Her body was found about 200 feet from where Heidi Villarreal Feist remains were found nearly 2 years earlier. The day after Jane Doe was found, about 50 feet from her body, the police found the body of Laura Miller, who went missing a year and a half earlier. Due to the condition of her body, a cause of death couldn't be determined. After the discovery of the 16-year-old's body, the area between Houston and Galveston was quiet yet again. By the autumn of 1988, it had been three years since the young woman went missing. On October 7, 1988, 22-year-old Suzanne Renee Richardson was working an overnight shift as a desk clerk at a condominium resort community in Galveston. She was last seen at 6 a.m. in the condominium's office by a security guard. Shortly after 6 a.m., an employee sleeping above the office heard a scream, then the sound of a car door slamming, and then a car speeding off. When a guest arrived at the office at 6.30 a.m., the office was empty and there was no sign of where Richardson went. What happened to her is still a mystery. Her body has never been found. On September 8, 1991, three years after Richardson went missing, another body was found in the oil field on Calder Road. She has yet to be identified, so she is called Janet Doe. She was about 31 years old, had long brown hair, and a small frame. She had suffered a spinal injury long before she was killed, and it may have caused her to have mobility problems. She had been dead at least six weeks before she was found. The police suspected that Janet Doe, who was the fourth body found in the killing fields, was not the work of the same killer who was responsible for the first three killings. They think this because it had been five years since the last bodies were found. Also, Janet's body was found in a different spot in the killing fields than where the other three bodies were found. The area experienced another quiet period, and people were hoping after two decades of murders that the killings had finally come to an end. That hope was shattered on May 13, 1994, when 16-year-old Trellis Sykes went missing while walking to school in Houston. 
Her body was found that afternoon about two miles away from her school. She had been strangled and beaten. On February 1, 1996, 14-year-old Lynette Bibbs and 15-year-old Tamara Fisher went missing after spending the evening at a teen club in Houston. Three days later, 40 miles away from where they were last seen, the bodies of both girls were found. They were found in a wooded area off Interstate 59 near Cleveland, Texas. Tamara had been shot in the forehead and below the left ear, and Lynette had been shot in the back of the head. Three months later, on March 5, 1996, 13-year-old Crystal Baker was found under a bridge in Chambers County, Texas. She was last seen alive two hours earlier, 50 miles away, when she stormed out of her grandmother's home in Texas City after a family argument. She had been strangled to death. Thirteen months later, on April 3, 1997, twelve-year-old Laura K. Smither left her family's home in Friendswood, Texas to go for a jog. When she didn't return home, her parents called the police. Her body was found two weeks later in a retention pond in Pasadena, about 14 miles away from her home. She was wearing nothing but her socks. She had been strangled and there were signs of trauma to the head. A month after Laura disappeared, on May 17, 1997, 19-year-old Sandra Sapa stopped at a convenience store on NASA Road 1, just seven miles away from where Susan Eads was killed 14 years earlier. A man pulled her into his truck and drove off. As he drove away, Sapa, who was pregnant at the time, jumped out of the speeding truck. She luckily wasn't too injured, and another motorist picked her up. Luckily, the fetus was not injured in her escape. On the night of June 7, 1997, a month after Sandra Sapa escaped from being kidnapped, 14-year-old Erica Ann Garcia went missing after visiting a teen nightclub in Houston. Her body was found the next day in a vacant lot, about a mile from where she was last seen alive. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Two months later, on August 17, 1997, 17-year-old Jessica Kane, who lived on Tiki Island, which is part of Gavelson County, attended a cast party for a play that she was in. A month later, she was supposed to start university to study criminology. Sadly, she never made it home after the party. She was last seen leaving the restaurant where the party was being held in Dickinson, Texas. Years went by, and no trace of Jessica Kane was found. The killings had also come to a stop, yet again. And in the summer of 2002, the area was rocked by yet another murder. On the evening of July 12, 2002, 23-year-old Sarah Trusty left her home in Algoa, Texas, to go for a bike ride. Later that evening, she was seen at a church near her home. She didn't return home that night, and she was reported missing. The bike that she was riding that night was found in the foyer of the church where she was last seen, but she was nowhere to be found. On July 28th, just a little over two weeks after she set out on her bike ride, her body was found on the Texas City Dyke, which is a levee in Texas City. The medical examiner was unable to determine how the 23-year-old woman died. On March 3, 2003, 16-year-old Maria Solis went missing after getting off a city bus close to her school in Houston. Nearly a year and a half later, her body was found by tree-cutting crews near Sugarland. The cause of death has never been made public. After Maria's murder, the murders of young women and girls in the area finally seemed to have come to an end. Starting with Colette Wilson in June 1971, at least 37 females were killed or went missing from the area between Houston and Galveston. The question then is, who is responsible for all these murders? As mentioned earlier in the video, it's suspected that at least four serial killers were active in the area throughout the three decades. 
In the years since the murders started, several men have been connected to some of the murders, and there have even been a few convictions. One of the strongest suspects for many of the murders is a man named Edward Harold Bell. In the 1970s, Bell was arrested several times for exposing himself to young girls. On August 24, 1978, Bell was cruising around in his pickup truck in Pasadena, Texas. He came across a group of young boys who were playing outside. He parked his truck and stepped out. He was naked from the waist down. As he walked towards the boys, he fondled himself. A woman named Dorothy Lane was inside her home looking out the window when she saw Bell get out of his truck. She called the police and her son, 26 year old Larry Dickens, heard her as she talked on the phone. Dickens, who was a former Marine, decided to do something about the situation. He went outside and took Bell's keys out of the ignition. Bell saw what Dickens did and he demanded his keys back, but Dickens refused to give them back. Bell grabbed a pair of jeans from his pickup truck and put them on. He then picked up a handgun and he pointed it at Dickens. He told Dickens to give him his keys back or he'd shoot. Bell then fired a shot in the air. Dickens told Bell that he wasn't going to shoot anyone and he should just calm down. He then took two or three steps towards Bell. When he did, Bell shot him five times. After being shot, Dickens staggered to his garage and his mother came out to help him. She told Bell he should leave because the police were coming. Bell said he wasn't going anywhere until he got his keys back. Dorothy Ling took the keys from her son's hand and threw them at Bell. Bell went back to his truck and Ling was hoping he would just drive away. Unfortunately, he didn't. Instead, he grabbed a rifle and walked back into the garage. While Lang begged him to leave her son alone, he fired several more shots into the 28-year-old father of two. Bell then got into his truck and drove away. Larry Dickens died in his mother's arms. The police arrived a few moments after Bell had fled. So they sped off in the direction that Bell had just driven. He led them on a high-speed chase, and then when he was cornered on a cul-de-sac, he fired his rifle at the police officers. He tried to fire again, but his rifle jammed. After the rifle jammed, the police were able to arrest him without anyone else getting hurt. Amazingly, despite the incredibly violent and unprovoked nature of his crime, Bell was granted bail and he was released two months after he was arrested to await his trial. When it came time for his trial, Bell had vanished. Five years later, Bell still had not been found and the television program Unsolved Mysteries did a segment on him. The segment, which featured Matthew McConaughey in his first television role, aired in December 1992. Two months later, thanks to tips from viewers of the show, Bell was arrested in Panama City, Panama. He was extradited back to Texas and he was sentenced to 70 years in prison for murdering Larry Dickens. In 1998, while serving his sentence, Bell wrote a letter to the district attorney saying that he killed seven girls in Galveston in the early 1970s. However, the letter was kept secret for 13 years. During those 13 years, Bell's confession wasn't investigated. In the letter, he named three victims and described the other four. In the letter, Bell claims they killed Debbie Ackerman and Maria Johnson, who were both 15 years old, and they were the ninth and 10th victims. They went missing in November 1971 from Gavelston. He wrote that another one of his victims was a teenage girl with reddish blonde hair named Pitchford. It's believed that he was referring to 16-year-old Kimberly Pitchford, who was killed on January 3, 1973, after attending a driver's ed class at a high school in Houston. 
The other girls he described are believed to be 13-year-old Colette Wilson, who went missing from Alvin, Texas in June 1971, 19-year-old Gloria Gonzalez, who went missing from West Houston in October 1971, and her remains were found near Colette's remains. And finally, he said he killed two girls from Webster. It's believed that he is referring to Rhonda Johnson and Sharon Shaw, who went missing in August 1971. They were the third and fourth girls to disappear. What is troubling about Bell's confession is that someone was already sitting in prison for the murder of Sharon Shaw. In May 1973, Michael Lloyd Self was convicted of the crime and he was given a life sentence. Self died in prison in 2000, two years after the district attorney received the confession letter from Bell. Self went to the grave maintaining his innocence and in the autumn of 2017, the Houston Chronicle interviewed Bell in prison, and he said he didn't just kill the seven girls. Instead, he said that there were 11 who went to heaven. He didn't name the other four victims, but he described them. It's believed that they were 14-year-old Georgia Greer and 12-year-old Brooks Bracewell, who were together when they went missing in 1974. He said he picked up another victim on the side of the highway and it's believed that he was talking about 16-year-old Nina Lynn Klug. She was murdered in 1975. The description of Bell's supposed 11th victim didn't match any known murders or disappearances. He said she had reddish blonde hair and he killed her in the mid-1970s. Records show that Bell was living in the area when the girls were killed and in some cases, he had personal connections to the places where they were last seen. Also, several of the girls were last seen getting into a van, and Bell owned a van at the time. Despite his confession, Bell has never been charged with any of these murders because there is no physical evidence proving he committed the murders. Some people don't think that Bell committed the murders, and he is just taking credit for them. Another suspect in some of the murders is Clyde Edwin Hedrick. Hedrick was arrested in July 1985 after the body of 29-year-old Ellen Ray Beeson was found stuffed under a couch that was abandoned near the Gavelston Causeway. In 2013, the police decided to re-examine Beeson's death and they had her body exhumed. Another autopsy was performed and it was determined that she died from blunt force trauma to the head. 28 years after Beeson died, Hedrick was arrested and he was charged with involuntary manslaughter. In 2014, he was found guilty and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. After his arrest, the police started looking into his past and they interviewed his former girlfriends. Several of his ex-girlfriends implicated him in the murders of 23-year-old Heidi Villarreal Fife and 16-year-old Laura Miller. Both young women went missing from the same convenience store. Villarreal Fife went missing in October 1983 and Laura went missing in September 1984. Both of their bodies were found in the field on Calder Road. It is also believed that Hedrick is responsible for the murder of the Jane Doe who was found in the field in February 1986. Hedrick claims that he didn't kill the three young women who were found in the field and no evidence ties him to the murders. As for the second Jane Doe who was found in the field in 1991 and is called Janet Doe, a man has confessed to that murder. Mark Rolling Stalling said that he picked up the woman who was strung out on drugs on NASA Road 1 and he killed her. When Stallings admitted to the murder, he was incarcerated. He is serving a life term for kidnapping an assault with a deadly weapon. The charges stem from an attempted prison escape. He tried to escape while serving two 50-year sentences for burglary and for shooting a man through an open window. The man he shot was wounded, but he didn't die. Stallings has never been charged with the murder of Janet Doe. He is also the prime suspect in the murders of two other women were not connected to the Texas Killing Field murders. Another suspect is a man named Robert Abel, 
who was Mark Rolling Stalling's boss when he supposedly killed Janet Doe. Abel was a former NASA engineer and he owned the property next to the oil field on Calder Road where the bodies of the four young women were found. The FBI developed a profile of who may have killed the four women and Abel matched the profile perfectly. However, there was no evidence or eyewitnesses that connected him to the murders. Also, he had no criminal record. The FBI profile was enough proof that Abel was the killer for Tim Miller, who was the father of Laura Miller, whose body was found in the field in 1986. Tim Miller claims that he even went to Abel's home and held a gun to his head. However, Abel denied that it ever happened. Tim Miller now thinks that Clyde Hedrick is the person who killed his daughter. Robert Abel has never been officially cleared as a suspect. He swore he was innocent, and he said that the accusations ruined his life. In July 2005, Abel was killed when the golf cart that he was driving was struck by a train. A fifth suspect in some of the murders is serial killer Anthony Allen Shore. In October 2003, Shore was brought in for questioning after cold case investigators linked DNA found under the fingernails of 21-year-old Maria del Carmen Estrada, who was sexually assaulted and strangled to death in April 1992 in Houston. Shore confessed to that murder, and he also confessed to three other ones. He said he committed his first murder in 1986, over five years before he killed Maria del Carmen Estrada. He said he kidnapped 15-year-old Laura Lee Tremblay from Houston as she was walking to school. She was the only one of his victims who wasn't sexually assaulted, but like the rest of his victims, he strangled her to death. Then two years after he killed Maria del Carmen Estrada, he claimed his third victim. He kidnapped nine-year-old Diana Reballer in August 1994 in Houston as she was walking the block from her home to a convenience store. Finally, he admitted to killing 16-year-old Diana Sanchez in July 1995. He got her into his van after offering her a ride home and then strangled her to death with a yellow cord. Shore was convicted of the four murders and he was sentenced to death. In the lead up to his execution, Shore confessed to a murder associated with the Texas killing fields. Texas Rangers interviewed him on death row and they determined that he didn't know the right details about the crime. The Rangers also questioned him about the murder of Susan Eads and after the interview, he was cleared as a suspect. Shore was executed on January 17, 2018. A sixth suspect is a man named Kevin Edison Smith. Smith worked for oil companies as a welder. In September 2010, he was arrested for the 1996 murder of Crystal Baker, the 32nd victim. Crystal was last seen alive by her family when she stormed out of her grandmother's home in Texas City and she was found two hours later under a bridge. In October 2009, a cold case investigator had DNA under her fingernails and on her clothes tested. It was male DNA, but it didn't match anyone in the database. Then 11 months later, Smith was arrested on an unrelated charge in Louisiana. A DNA sample was taken, and when it was put into the database, it was matched to the DNA found under Crystal's fingernails and on her clothes. He is suspected of committing other murders, and not just in Texas, but in Louisiana, Arizona, and North Carolina. However, he has only been charged with killing Crystal Baker. He was convicted of that murder in April 2012, and he was sentenced to life. A final suspect is a man named William Lewis Reese. Reese was released from prison in Oklahoma in 1996 after he served 10 years for two sexual assaults. When he got out of prison, he got a job in construction, and even though he lived in Oklahoma, he often worked on construction sites in Texas. After the murder of 12-year-old Laura K. Smither in April 1997, he was considered the prime suspect, but he was never charged due to a lack of evidence. 
In May 1997, he kidnapped Sandra Sapa, who escaped by jumping out of his truck as it was moving. Reese was arrested five months later for attempting to kidnap Sandra Sapa. He was convicted and he was sentenced to 60 years in prison. Unfortunately, in those five months between the attempted kidnapping and his arrest, Reese committed several more murders. First, he killed 20-year-old Kelly Cox. On July 15, 1997, Cox disappeared after touring the Denton County Jail with her criminology class. She called her boyfriend and said that she locked her keys in her car. When he arrived at the jail with a spare key to the car, Cox was nowhere to be found. On July 26, Reese kidnapped 19-year-old Tiffany Johnson from a car wash in Bethany, Oklahoma. She was later found strangled to death. DNA evidence linked Reese to Johnson's murder in 2015. In March 2016, Reese directed the police to a field that is 30 miles south of Houston in West Orem. Buried in the field, they found the remains of Kelly Cox. In the same field, they also found the remains of 17-year-old Jessica Kane, who disappeared on August 17, 1997, after she attended a cast party for a play that she was in. Reese has been charged with the murders of Laura K. Smither, Kelly Cox, Tiffany Johnson, and Jessica Kane, but he has yet to go to trial for any of those charges. Out of those seven suspects, it is thought that they are responsible for 20 of the 37 murders. It's possible that the seven men are responsible for more murders, just not near the killing fields, but in other states as well. Also, there are the four men who claim they were innocent, but they were nevertheless convicted of three of the murders in 1972. One of those murders was the murder of Sharon Shaw, which Michael Lloyd Self was convicted of, and Edward Bell took credit for her murder in his letter in 1998. If the other three men really did commit the other two murders, that still leaves 15 unsolved murders. This includes the murder of Susan Eads. The police are hoping that someone will recognize the voice of the mysterious caller so that the friends and family of Susan Eads will at least know who is responsible for stealing her from their lives. Also, identifying him could bring closure to many other families who lost daughters, sisters, and mothers around the Texas killing fields. Hello? Hello? You said you knew Sue. Well, I still can't believe that I never knew of you. I don't understand that. Some people have a secret she knows that she likes to keep herself. You have some pictures of her, you told me. I'd like to see. Just you, I ain't gonna show them to anyone else. Would you want me to meet you somewhere? My place or a motel or something like that. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you liked it, please subscribe for more videos just like it. Please don't forget to visit criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases and buy merchandise. Please also check out our Patreon page where you can get access to an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.